Okay, we are very happy to be joined by friend of the show, Bob Roop, for a second appearance with us here on Breaking Kayfabe. Uh, Bob, how are you doing today, buddy? Good. Very good. Nice talking to you. Thank you. And our, of course, friend uh, Barry uh, Rose is with us here. And we are going to be discussing the life and the legacy of Dick Slater, who we just lost a couple of days ago. Barry, how you doing? I'm doing good and excited to have Bob back with us. I, Jeff, am I wrong or is this the first time we've ever had a guest on twice? I believe you are correct, sir. Wow. So we are going to be doing a, a little bit of a dive into the career of uh, Dick Slater and more importantly, into the beginning of the career of Dick Slater because Bob... As I understand, you were right there on hand and were one of the people that helped train Dick when he first started out. Yeah, when I broke in, he he had not started yet. He was still, he and I are, I think, 11 years difference in age. So he was still in his, maybe late, maybe not that much, but he wasn't, uh, he was hanging around with Mike Graham, but he wasn't, um, he wasn't working yet. So uh, I saw him occasionally, but then when he did break in, he started hanging out more and more. I'd see him at the sportatorium a lot. And, and when he did break in, he was uh, he was a natural. You know, I was uh, not envious, but I uh, admir- admiring because he uh, he took to it right away. And I, I'd sort of, uh, I try to analyze things. And I try to figure out why that was the case where, um, and uh, I, I'll give you real quick, real quick psycho babble here. I was kind of formed and established at age 26 when I broke in. I'd been in the service. I had done college and finished. And, and my, my 13-year amateur background, I was established as a person. So to become an, uh, you know, a performer and a showman, uh, I had to carry all that personality already developed with me. Now, sure, to, to extrapolate, uh, since you were, used the word egregious in private, I have to try out one big one. To extrapolate, uh, uh, I think when Dickie broke in, I think that he was more of a, not an empty vessel, but one that um, the script lines had not yet been written as far as, as uh, uh, the kind of personality he displayed in the ring. So I think he was far better able to, in his own mind, go out there and visualize himself in the role of a professional wrestler and and perform his actual physical behavior uh in that in that you know in that mode and i wasn't i had to overcome a bunch of stuff first but i do remember really it, I was thinking man this guy is you know he's precocious as heck he's uh because he took to it right away yeah, that, that's one of the things, too, and yeah, I've been watching wrestling for uh, four decades at this point, and there are a few wrestlers that I remember were as good as Dick Slater right out of the gate. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the early training, because a lot of the obituaries that, I, we, that Jeff and I both uh, read this past week had you as one of his initial trainers. Well, yes, in a sense. It was, uh, it, as far as the... Pro stuff, not me, because I was kind of green myself. I, I mean, I could have shown the bit. You know, usually you show a guy a headlock and take over and, you know, two or three basic moves. And then, you know, if he has any with me because of some background, um, they trotted me out there pretty quickly. I mean, they put me in very small shows with guys like John Heath and, and uh, Don Curtis, who had amateur backgrounds, uh, to get me used to being in the ring. But with... Uh, where I came in and trained Dickie, and it was him, uh, and I think it was just once. So, you know, that training is needs to have, a, you know, some quotation marks around it because it might have been just one session, but it was him, Ron Fuller, uh, Paul Orndorff, and Mike Graham. And Mike was already working, of course, but um, Eddie had this fixation about, uh, I don't want to say shooting, but, he wanted to have guys, that, and this is not a bad thing. Uh, he wanted to have guys uh, that could handle themselves in the ring, you know, in case somebody, you know, a fan jumped in the ring or whatever the case might be, in case uh, maybe one of the boys would lose his mind and, you know, and try to grab a shooting hold or something. And so he had me uh, working out with guys, and what we did is we just, we were at the sportatorium, and all, all five of us, well, Eddie was watching, but, um, and, you know, the guys would take turns going in the ring, 
and we just start on our feet and do takedowns. And, uh, and then uh, I showed them a, a few things, a front base lock, and, and I mean, I learned these things myself, mainly to defend myself. I didn't, I wasn't really interested in using them, but um, Carol uh, Matsuda broke me in, and he, um, we didn't know each other at all. And we go on our feet for like 45 minutes. And I, this is not the I, hero. I, I loved him dearly, but you know, I've said he's not with us anymore. But uh, early on, he he broke in the hard way in Japan. Those guys got brutalized to make sure that they were committed. I mean, just absolutely uh, 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 chargeable offenses, assault and battery. They got brutalized when they were being broken in. And so he wanted to make sure he, you know, I mean, his famous one, I guess, is breaking uh, uh, Terry Bollet, Hulk Hogan's uh, ankle or whatever, to make sure he was, uh, you know, was dedicated. But uh, here did the same thing with me. He did a couple of things that were uh, uh, questionable in terms of, like, a, a straight workout. Uh, he could have hurt me if I didn't know how to react. And I just uh, immediately... Uh, Turn on my. I, one time, I was in the referee's position with my my feet, my toes down, and he dropped a knee. When we started, he dropped a knee on my Achilles tendon. If I hadn't been able to adjust, he could have uh, done a bunch of things. He could have, worst case, uh, ruptured the tendon, broke my ankle, dislocated it. Uh, even in the best case, but I just immediately turned with it, and I reached up and grabbed him by the hair and stuck my thumb, not in his eye, but like on his eyebrow. To let him know, uh, I'm not sure what you're doing here, sir, but if you uh, persist, uh, you're going to have to do it with uh, only half your vision. And uh, he immediately stopped, of course, and, and he never did anything. He never tried anything after that. Uh, I think that he felt, rightfully so, that I was qualified. Now, uh, I'm sorry, you guys have got an old man over here and, you know, long-winded. Just real briefly with Hero, extrapolate from that. And around the wrestling office, that place was a snake pit, and he was very, very uh, reserved and uh, very closed off. Even when he was running the place in later years when I was booking there, when I, he was coming into Japan one time as I was leaving, and we were met at the airport, and my plane got delayed by six or seven hours. And Hero and I sat there and drank beer for four or five hours, <laughs> To the extent I, I got on a plane and there were six of those seats in the middle open, I slept all the way back to the United States. But we laughed and joked. It was a completely different person. I mean, just, you know, I saw a side of him that I never saw before where he was one of the boys. He was away from his ownership responsibilities in the Florida office. He had 10 points, I think, out of the 100. And and uh, so he, he showed us his... His real personality, which was very warm and friendly and good sense of humor, smart guy. So I don't want to, like, blacken his name with this you know, dropping on my ankle thing. His, his uh, goal was to prove that, uh, to want to find out for himself if you were dedicated. Because he had probably had some guys come in the business from either maybe not just amateur wrestling, but, say, pro football, guys who had a name that were not, you know, were not what he considered dedicated. They were going to go out there and, and you know, not try to make a good, you know, not take care of themselves. And, and also, you know, he didn't want to have anybody, any of these people be able to have someone from the audience come in there and beat, beat them up or take them down and make a fool out of them because that, that, that injured, the, you know, the reputation of all of us. So I don't blame his attitude. But anyway... Uh, with yeah, I, what I did is just with Schrader and, and the rest of them, uh, I just showed them some how to defend themselves mostly. Well, but, let me ask you about let me ask you, Bob. So you know, you were talking about uh, Slater. Slater has always had the reputation, uh, uh, although he was you know generally regarded as a real tough guy. He was not a guy that's you know let's be honest. He didn't have any sort of uh, amateur background. So that, you know he wrestled in high school and such though, but he didn't have any kind of uh, you know national background like you would have had. So when you talk about the snake pit, he was was he a guy that was going into the snake pit like you and Hero and Jack Briscoe, or was he just a guy that happened to be there for a couple of days? Uh, he was breaking in, uh, and you're right. He didn't have, he didn't have the chops, uh, 
you know, a few people did, Jack, you know, and myself. But we spent years, you know, we spent college and sure. And uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, he didn't he didn't pursue it. Uh, no, he didn't have that that level of. When I worked out with him, and again, this is not to disparage him, but you know, I was world class, and I, I had no problem. He couldn't defend himself against me, and I wasn't that much bigger, and he, I wasn't much stronger, and I could take him down with ease. So I, I never had an idea. He he reacted like a wrestler. Now, working out with uh, someone like a football player or like a basketball player, like Ron Fuller, uh, is dangerous for a wrestler because they don't know how to react. And you, you know, a wrestling uh, paint, uh, like a paint move to try to get them, you know, in a position where you can shoot a takedown, maybe, maybe have them step back or step forward by you, the way you move your body. Wrestlers are trained to react in certain ways, but these other guys aren't. I had some of my worst injuries, and they were usually a knee to the face working out with football players because I, you know, I'd make a move where they should draw their leg back. Instead, they'd go to defend themselves, and, and they'd bring a, a knee forward, and I'd catch it right in the face. So I had to learn not to go directly in on any of these guys. They'd go out to the side. But um, Dickie didn't, uh, you know, he did have the, the defensive uh, actions of a wrestler. But as far as, the, you know, and with the other guys, I don't remember them. Whether he was a, a great takedown guy, it, nothing stands out. Um, but it, it might have been. Uh, sure, maybe and, I, that, maybe and, and, and I and I think the the general consensus is that you know while on the mat Slater might not have been in your class or a Jack Briscoe's class where you do want Slater to have your back is like if you're in a bar room setting because that's where he and guys like Harley Race uh, and maybe Wahoo that's where they really were uh, at their strong point. Would that be fair to say? Yes, uh, but I, I, I I'm sorry, I just have to qualify that. Harley Race, I was ever in a bar with Wahoo, and I know Wahoo was a tough guy. Harley was a tough, dangerous man. Uh, Harley had, when I first met him, he had a bite mark on the back of his hand, uh, the imprint of someone's upper teeth uh, that was just healing. And I you know, asked him about it, and uh, we had just gone 45 minutes in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and to me, 45 minutes seemed like 10 years. And with Harley, it went by just like quick as, I mean, he just was a beautiful, I was green, I about a year in the business, and and uh, just a beautiful match. And so we were talking down the road or sometime later, and, and I asked him about the hand, and he'd been in a bar and somebody was giving him trouble, and and uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't give any kind of indication. He just backhanded the guy in the mouth, and uh, uh, that, 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 you know, he had to follow up with whatever, he, I don't know if he kicked him in the head or hit him with a chair, but the fight was over and Harley went back to his beer in about like five seconds after it started. The only other guy I ever saw with that mark was a, a guy named uh, McGinnis, uh, who was alone, was like a Rocky. He was a, a loan shark collector and he had the same, his was the same thing. It was a backhand of the chops. And um, that's, it, th when I say deadly dangerous, it's the toughness to be able to do that is, is a, a state of mind. The actual way that you implement your toughness uh, can be more lethal with some people. And Harley is uh, in a completely a, a different league. I don't know about Wahoo, but Harley's in a different league than most people, including me. Um, I have these tricks that I know from learning about them from them. But if I if I if I had ever had to fight, I wouldn't. But without knowing of those things, I wouldn't have been able to do them because I didn't have the same uh, mindset. Harley had completely different backgrounds. But Dickie was, uh, you know, he had. I, my, there was a story that there was this pro football player that was scared to death of him, and I just never. I, I'm not trying to belittle Dickie, and I'm not trying to elevate myself. I just never saw the, the need to be sprayed of him. Uh, you know, you use your, your ESP, your instincts, and, and all that. Well, I mean, he had no reason to be. Well, yeah, he did. We actually had violence between us, which is very rare for pro wrestlers. I mean, real violence outside the ring. But I never felt, I never felt threatened by him in the sense that I was 
any fight, if you're not afraid, uh, you're crazy because, you know, you, you couldn't get hurt. But I was never f afraid to the point of, like, really desperately afraid, like I was when I almost got killed in Iraq. I mean, I was just absolute PTSD type of afraid. And uh, and that's not to put Dickie down. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure that um, just, that, just the idea that he enjoyed that reputation and, and uh, uh, or if he did, I, I'm not sure, but if he did. And the other thing is when I, hang around, when I hung around with him, I mean, we were in bars and all different things. I never saw any of that. I never saw him pushing his way around. And I mean, to him, this just speaks to him in terms of his level of behavior and class. I never saw him, you know, here's the two of us who probably could maybe take any three guys in the bar. Although that's that's let me back off on that because the bar is really dangerous. One guy in the right position could be could have beat the two of us. But um, you know, I never saw it. He was we hung around and he he just kind of hung 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 in there with me and we I was never looking for trouble. So uh, I never saw that. But I heard about it. I heard a lot about it. I mean, the boys like to you know. Telephone, telegraph, tell a rustler. The boys love to talk about stuff like that. And, uh, he, he, he had to rep. I, yeah, I agree with you about that. Gotcha. So you just, a couple of minutes ago, or a few minutes ago, you mentioned Wahoo McDaniel and Dick Slater. And wasn't there an incident, and, and I'm not sure if it was Florida or Georgia, that involved Wahoo, Dick Slater, and a gun? Yeah, Dickie was coming. I was booking in, in uh, Knoxville, and Dickie was, uh, yeah, I knew him, and, and uh, uh, he was real friends, good friends with Bobby Jr., and he, he was coming in. You know, he was a good talent. I was glad to have him. And so he was scheduled to come in. I get this call that uh, he'd been in a bar with Wahoo, and they, you know, Wahoo pulled out a gun for some reason. It wasn't against him. It was an accident. But he ended up getting shot in the knee. So I don't remember, it seemed like we sent someone from Knoxville to go get him and drive his car because he couldn't drive. And drive him, I think they were in Atlanta, and drove, drove him to Knoxville. And, uh, and he, uh, he, he stayed on my, he laid on the couch in my living room for like, oh, I don't know, two or three weeks while he was healing. And he was booked, you know, we had to substitute his matches. And uh, uh, right. Ron Fuller wasn't happy because I asked Dickie. I had gotten a guarantee for Dickie, and and uh, I asked Ron to pay him even though he wasn't working, which, you know, I I, I look back, I think I was maybe asking a little much, but the, the business, we were doing great business. Ronnie Garvin and Malenko were just, you know, were hot. The stomper was there. I mean, you know, they were, their territory was on fire, so Ron could certainly afford it. And, and so uh, I got Dickie paid while he was laying on my couch, and... Uh, yeah, he, he was, I don't know exactly, he never told me the details. I mean, I, I imagine if he'd seen it coming, he would have jumped in the air or something, but he ended up getting shot, and uh, I never asked Wahoo about it either. Um, I, I wonder if there's somebody out there who might know that story, but I'm sorry, I don't know more. I know the resulting uh, uh, scenario from it, but not actually what, how it happened. Gotcha. Jeff, did you have a question for Bob? Yeah, well, one of the things you know that that uh, Dickie was was very well known for, and I wanted to get your thoughts on it is, you know, th there's sort of a uh, first part of Dickie's career and a second part, and one of the things that uh, you know when he first broke in the business in Florida, and we're talking you know the mid '70s, you know, plus a little past that, he was always regarded as a guy who people could see potentially as a as a future world champion. He was that talented and that gifted from the get go, but then towards the uh, the second part of his career. He became seemingly obsessed with Terry Funk. And if you're going to emulate anybody, Lord knows Terry Funk is a great person to emulate because he's an all-time great. But he seemed like he was going out there and there was a lot of, uh, let me let me do my, uh, tonight I'm going to be Terry Funk. Did you uh, get a bit of that uh, as you watched him? Oh, I got a, I got a, uh, a barrel load of it. He, he actually, it was pathological. He, he, was, he, he became left-handed. Uh, Terry's left-handed, you know, and Dickie isn't. He started, actually, I think he wanted to be Terry Funk. Um, and not just, when I talked, again, about, when I talked about earlier about, 
you know, mentally try to project and figure out why people do the thing they, or, you know, behave the way they do. Um, he was, in a sense, an empty shell in terms of having a foreign personality. So he, he liked Terry's personality. Terry was, you know, extremely talented. Although, see, in that, in that sense, the gap between him and Terry and talent wasn't that much. I mean, it was still pretty wide. But it wasn't that much. In terms of experience, it was uh, oceans wide. It was exponentially. Terry grew up in the business. I mean, he had forgotten more than Dickie he probably ever learned. But, um, but he had, plus Terry was universally respected and liked. I mean, Terry would do stuff. He would rip on the square. I, mean, I remember sitting in a dressing room with uh, the Florida promoters all in a room and three or four or five of the boys uh, changing and Terry's making jokes. You know, he was part of a, he was a promoter himself at Amarillo, and Terry's making these jokes on the square about promoters being thieves and stealing money from wrestlers. <laughs> yeah, and he's laughing when he say it, so the promoters are laughing, but he was ribbing on the square. What he was doing is insulting the crap out of them and, and uh, calling them thieves, and, uh, and they were laughing right along with him. Well, that's a rare talent. You know, Terry had to... He was very, very. He's a very, very intelligent person, and uh, and Dickie wanted to be him. He actually he, he started walking like him and dressing like him, and just he wanted to be Terry Funk. Um, he didn't want to be like Terry Funk. He wanted to be Terry Funk, and uh, it's yeah. It's uh, I looked at him uh, with uh, a bit of a jaundiced eye. Uh, he imitated other people. He imitated Dusty for a while too, not so much in looks, of course, because they're good to remarkable physical difference, but his behavior. Uh, he, he became very flamboyant, like Dusty was for a while, not long. Uh, that I don't think that suited him that well. But um, yeah, he was. I think he was able to take on. I mean, the wrestling business is show business, and you know, you act out. Um, some people actually acted out too much they became become you know multi you know, bipolar or multi-personality disorder but um you know you act out you act out roles and and he wanted to he wanted to have uh, the real life uh, role of being terry funk uh which you know i understand why terry would love the guy uh you know any imitation to some source form of flattery if someone actually wants to be you i mean how more flattering could you be so uh, anyway, it was a little off-putting to me though, because again, I, you know, I had already, well, I, I had, I left out. I already had three years in the service too. Uh, so uh, you know, I had a completely different mindset to Dickie, and I didn't know his background, you know, in terms of him growing up, and we never talked about it. He never had much to say. We didn't. I didn't talk about mine with him, and he didn't talk. We never talked at that level. I don't think it was always superficial and about the business or what's going on, <clears throat> what might be ahead, not not anything about the, the, the past. So I don't know much about his background. I knew uh, that Bob, his, Bob, can I ask you a question? I, I don't mean, because I know Barry's going to take the next question, but did you ever share a, a, a car with uh, with Dick on a road trip, you know, from town to town? Yeah. I, oh, okay. I, stayed, I stayed with him in Tampa for, we were close at one time. I okay. stayed with him in an apartment in Tampa for a week when he was gone and a week when he was there. And, uh, you know, we hung around, you know, quite a bit. Like I say, I never felt a real connection. I, I, I liked him okay. I mean, it's flattering that, uh, you know, a guy wants to be around you. But he was always kind of the sidekick. You know, he never, he never said much and, and just kind of followed me around. And, and I wasn't, I, I mean, I'm looking back at this now. I, I didn't see it that way at the time. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I knew him. I, I knew Dick. Yeah, so one of the you, you, we're talking about Terry Funk, and Terry Funk is, uh, I guess, I consider myself extremely fortunate that I was able to see so much of his career and able to see him live. And I've gone on record, Bob, saying that I think one of the greatest wrestling matches I ever saw was the match that took place in 1976 at the Miami Highlight Fronton 
when you challenged Terry Funk for the NWA World Heavyweight title. And it was a great match, and it was essentially you were, you were one of the top heels in the state. I think it was in the middle of the feud that you had with Steve Kern at the time, which was, we've discussed, one of the greatest feuds, I think, in the history of professional wrestling, not just the state of Florida. But this match against Terry Funk was fantastic. Did you and Terry ever work a program together? outside of, because in Florida, I don't believe it ever happened, but in another territory, did you guys ever work against each other? I, actually, I, uh, you know, new information for you, and that's great because that's what life is, is it, as long as you want to stay healthy and, and, and progress and keep learning. We did. We uh, When Harley was booking, I was helping him, and I got uh, <laughs> I got to towns, so I got all the towns, like, uh, uh, Monday was Orlando and and West Palm Beach, so Harley would would uh, you know Orlando was about 90 miles from Tampa and West Palm was I don't know 200 between two and 250, so I would I was running West Palm for I don't know about six seven eight months I think and and um, uh, Terry and I got into a program down there, and you talk about you were here here I am and I'm I'm still learning and I mean we all are every day, hopefully, but in the business, I'm still learning the ropes in a, in a sense and about booking. And I get in a program in West Palm with him to where every week, um, you know, we were doing things on TV, but every week we could get together in West Palm because you could get to the locker rooms are separated, but there's a way in the back that you could get together. And we would talk over, I, you know, finishes and things. And he was, you know, he was very deferential. He wasn't, pushy or, you know, like saying, hey, I'm a vet, real vet here, you're, you know, kind of a newbie. But the way I felt, and certainly looking at it now, he was a professor emeritus, I might have been like a freshman in college, and, uh, you know, talking with him and, and coming up with ideas of, and programs and things, you talk about an end value in terms of, uh, you know, helping me move forward uh, in my own career. And certainly as a booker and, and, and my own, uh, pro, you know, providing my own, uh, uh, you, you know, when you're trying to get over the territory, if you know how to help yourself, a big help. If you could tell the promotion how to actually get you over or at least help in doing that, it's a big help. So, yeah, Terry and I had about six months, and that was just beautiful. And the matches, of course, learning in the ring. We very, very seldom ever had to say anything to each other. And, uh, you know, even though I was the heel, uh, he, uh, you know, he would lead uh, parts and I would lead parts. And, and it was just, it was beautiful. I mean, it was, uh, he was a genius, you know, he was a genius. He's completely different from Junior, but they were both geniuses in the ring. They had their own style. And Senior, I got to watch him work out in Amarillo. He was, he was the uh, same thing. He was, a, I, I know where their smarts came from. He was a very, very intelligent guy and a great worker. You know, he's still in the ring, old, bald, kind of like I look now. And he could go in there and, uh, you know, it's always, always funny. He wore a, a holiday end towel down the ring with him around his neck. And um, he would go in there and never went off his feet. He'd be in the ropes and sell. But uh, he still, he had, you know, it was over. He had him. Uh, people believed him. He still drew money. You know, he's probably a... 50s or 60s, and no, he would have been a 60s by then probably. So, anyway, uh, yeah, real uh, uh, those guys, what what great talents. Yeah, you know, a lot of people. There, there's not a lot of uh, history about Dory Senior as as time has progressed and gone on. Uh, did you ever have a chance to go and talk to him in the office? Uh, not a lot, but uh, uh, you know, you heard the stories and everything. Terry and I hung hung around out there some. Uh, because when I, I think when I started out there as a baby face, but, um, when I came a heel, we, we couldn't, um, we couldn't mingle, but, um, you know, I heard, I heard the story and, you know, they would be able to verify it, but that the way they, they promote one of the promotional tools they used in Amarillo was Terry and senior would go out to the bars and, uh, wait for somebody to say something and get into a, uh, brawl and get arrested and uh or at least get into the brawl and maybe pay for the damages or whatever but you know the word got out these guys 
well, these pro wrestlers, these so-called phonies, are uh, these guys are tough. I don't know about the rough those guys, you know, but these two guys are, are the real deal. And it was, you know, it was a great promotional tool. And, you know, I, I imagine bail, uh, you know, was expensive. But, you know, after a while, um, they were so well known there that they got away with stuff that nobody in the world could get away with without being arrested. And, uh, uh, you know, I, oh, man, some of the stuff I saw hanging around with Terry. But, uh uh, yeah, Senior was a very intelligent man, uh, educated, but also world, you know, world wise, and uh, wise to the ways of the world, and good promoter, good guy, funny, great sense of humor, uh, very pleasant to be around. But uh, anybody that would underestimate his intelligence would be making a big mistake. Well, what am I talking about? Him, Eddie Graham, and Bob Geigel all had their own guys be world champions. Dory had two of them. Both his sons, world champion. Eddie had Jack Briscoe and Goggle had Harley. You know, they, those guys, uh, yeah, they were smart because they had to get the rest of the promoters to agree to, to do it. But by voting together in a block, they were able to, you know, they had some sway. Um, they probably promised, okay, when this guy gets through, uh, we'll vote for your guy or whatever. I don't know how they did it, but by, you know, like at our Congress today, but in, in their little convention every year, they had that three vote block that was very powerful. And so, yeah, they were smart. I mean, that's the smartest thing. You get a guy go out and be a world champion and travel everywhere. You get him out of your own territory for two or three years. And then he comes back and you give him a little time off to rest. And then you got a guy who's back in your territory. He's one of your main stars who's been a world champion. I mean, you just, how, how better you, you couldn't do anything more in your own territory than you already have to get him over. But you've got him over by him not being there, which is, you know, somebody else paid to get him over, even stronger, which is really smart business when you think about it. Yeah, absolutely, too. So, Bob, so in your career, you, you really were all over the world. I know you spent a lot of time in Australia. Uh, you spent time, you know, all throughout the United States. You were in Japan. Was there anybody that you saw during your travels that you said, this guy is going to draw money. This, is, this guy is going to be absolutely a star in the professional wrestling business, and then for whatever reason, it didn't happen. Was there anybody that really made an impression like that on you? Uh, well, I want to say a young, I think his name was in Houston, Gino Hernandez, is that the right name? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, uh, he wasn't in the business yet, but uh, he was hanging around when I worked out there uh, for uh, uh, Fritz for uh, about seven, eight months. And I thought, you know, once I, it's sort of a delayed thing because he had such looks. He had these great looks and, and you know, his father was a wrestler, his family. And so uh, I thought that he had uh, all kinds of potential. And I guess he was very good, but he had he had the demons that uh, you know a lot of guys have, and and uh, you know he kind of self destructed. But uh, I thought that he was going to be somebody really special. Um, let me think in terms of breaking in guys. Um, well, I worked up. I worked well, out. I tell, you what, I tell you what, Bob. While you're thinking about that, let me ask you the flip side of that question. Did you ever have anybody that you thought to yourself, ah, "This guy's never going to be anything in the business," and ended up actually having a pretty decent career? Uh, I can't really think of anybody. Um, I, you know, I was, I was, uh, I, I was never playing politics when I was in the business. You know, I I did my own thing. If I wasn't happy someplace, I just left. And um, I didn't make a lot of uh, close friendships hard in the business, you know, because, you know, a lot of times you're, uh, many times, I, when I first started, Jack Briscoe and I were good good friends. We traveled together, and then once I came a heel, I couldn't travel with him anymore, you know. And it's, it's, it's a shame, you know. You really can't get together in public at their, your apartment or theirs, unless you're out somewhere, you know, where nobody can see you. Uh, so it's difficult to have enduring friendships. And uh, uh, I'm lucky I have I'm still uh, good friends with Ronnie Garvin and uh, 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 Jim Raschke. I never even worked on a show with him, but we were friends before we got into business, either one of us. 
and we're still good friends to this day. And I would have been good friends with Timmy Woods. I, I was, but he, he's passed. What a shame. I just had gotten it back with him after so 20 years. I knew him when I was in high school. He was at Michigan State. And he yeah, actually, he and Jim were responsible for getting me in the Hall of Fame. You talk about a voting block. I had those two guys push me for the, was the, um, the, the committee was the, all the boys voted for, the guys who were in the Hall voted for the next class. And those two got, to, not together, but they both pushed me. When I, my name came up, they both said, yeah. Because, you know, we were friends. They liked me. And they, they, knew, they, they valued my amateur uh chops more than a lot of the guys did. I think probably uh, Mad Dog Rashawn would have too. He might have gone along with it too because uh, back in 2006, the amateur part was still uh, a big part of being inducted. And I'm not saying that it isn't today, but the museum needs to, to survive. In order to do that, you need to have fans come. And so they have gone... Um, more in years, more with the name uh, of the pro side than with the amateur chops, which I have no absolutely no problem with that because, you know, if you're in a museum, you should want the museum to survive whatever it takes as long as you're, you know, not ripping people off. Uh, otherwise, you know, your your stature of being in a Hall of Fame, if the Hall of Fame is defunct, you're no longer in it, are you? Sure, so, sure, absolutely. That's, yeah, absolutely. So, so Bob, circling back to Dick Slater too. So you, you were, if I'm correct, you were responsible for bringing Dick into the Knoxville area, uh, and then it, it unfortunately led to a falling out with your friendship. Would you want to share that story with us? Uh, yeah, I, you know, no moral judgments, but uh, just what happened was uh, one of the things we wanted to do was. Uh, uh, for going opposition, um, I had gone to the promoter twice about the the the, the payoffs, and um, and I was just countered. I had nothing was. I got no satisfaction from the answers. Let's put it that way. So we were talking about it. I was going to leave. I was just going to give my notice and leave because you can only be robbed if you allow yourself to be. Even if I was, even though I was a booker, I was going to give my notice and you know I'd give a month or two weeks at least and and leave. But it, you know that's the only way you could protest, really. You know I was making good money, but I was still getting I was getting um, short change. So, but now Bob, uh, we I, Bob have, if I if I could interrupt you just for one second, just for clarification, are you talking about Ron Fuller or someone else? Ron Fuller. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. Go ahead. I'm sorry I interrupted. Well, uh, you know, I again, I just didn't get satisfaction from him. And I knew Ron. You know, I talked about helping break him in down there in, in Tampa year, years before. You know, I never heard any of those guys. So he never, I'm sure if I had, he would have not had me want to have me come and work for him in Knoxville. But, um, you know, and, and we were talking, and I, like I said, I was going to leave. And, I, I think it was Ronnie that brought it up. I'm not trying to pass the buck here, but because I went along with it, but Ronnie said, "Why don't we take the territory?" And Ron was actually working, and he had a promotion in in Florida somewhere, and uh, Mo, or, or somewhere in the south. Pensacola. And yeah, Robert was uh, down there booking, and Ron went down there to work. So here we are, basically Malenko, Ronnie, and I were. Ronnie had all these great experiences as a booker, and Malenko had all this experience from his years as a heel. And we put together some stuff. I was mostly the guy offering bad ideas that they could come up with something better. And the three of us came up with this, just some beautiful stuff. And a lot of people, you know, hated the theatrical part of it. But what they didn't understand, you know, okay, I'm old school. I don't like this stuff. We bring people down to bring in a big carton box and all that. What they didn't understand was after we did that, that helped get the people in the building. After they did that, then Ronnie and Malenko or me and Bobby and against whoever we were wrestling would go out and have a hell of a match. I mean, we give them, you know, so we got them there in the building and then we'd go out. It wasn't like, okay, the box was a whole deal. The box was just a, unwrapping the present. The present was the match. And we had these great matches afterwards, but they were these so-called purists and Old timers said, "Oh, that all that crap just makes the business. No, it doesn't make the look, business look bad. 
what makes the business look bad is an empty auditorium. When the auditorium's full and people are screaming and crying and going crazy and they come back week after week, you tell me that's hurting the business? Not if you're not if you're not killing it by you know hot shotting every every week. And we weren't doing that. We were we had a great thing going. I had those two great experienced guys as like senior advisors. To uh, I was in charge, but only really technically. Well, I was getting paid extra, so yeah, I was, and I took the heat too, but and willingly. Uh, that was my job to be between the owner and the boys, uh, leg in one camp and leg in the other. And uh, it's hard to be management and uh, staff at the same time, but the booker has to kind of try to do that. Otherwise, you lose the boys completely. Uh, and if you go to all the boys, you lose your job. So, um, but anyway, I had those two great guys, and we, we were making it, we were popping the territory, and, and the money wasn't there as a result of our labors. And when Ronnie said, let's take it, I I had the thought, I've been thinking for years about trying to have a union. So I thought, well, if we had a basis here, oh, it's a beautiful territory too, short trips, and that is just beautiful, good weather. And and so, um, you know, I could see staying there for years if if possible. And so I thought, you know, we'd get a union. This would be the basis of having a union, and, and guys could come to work there who were, you know, had the same mindset we did that we didn't want to be stolen from and guys could come and work there and not have to worry about being blackballed. And, uh, you know, if we made big stars of them, I don't care if other promoters said, oh, I'll never use that guy. If he's drawing money in Knoxville, well, when it's time for him to go, believe me, there'd be five or six promoters who forgot all that stuff about not using them. They see money. Uh, there's, you know, a prize heifer out there loose. Uh, they're going to go try to rope them in. So I never worried about that. But we were going to start a union. And to me, it made sense. Basketball, baseball, and football had done it. And now all of a sudden, these guys that used to be slaves were millionaires. And uh, I thought, uh, hey, why not? And so that was that was my ultimate goal. And, you know, the idea of, of uh, having own promotion, of course, and all the, all the things that come with it, the financial uh, reward and all that was attractive, too. But uh, we, uh, uh, you know, Dickie and I had a falling out over that. He uh, was part of our our partnership, and if he had told me about it first, it would have been, uh, yeah, there would have been some heat. But he could have still, uh, he still could have had my respect. But he he went and told the, the promoters, the uh, NWA promoters, what we were doing. And uh, he got my job. I was fired as a booker. He got the booking job. And uh, I still had. To, we were still going going to go off. We just couldn't tell them. Couldn't you know? I've been put, uh, fired. And but I had two weeks. I was booked two weeks ahead. So I said I'll work out my notice. And uh, so I had to walk around the dressing room. Dickie's walking around with a book, and and uh, you know I just swallowed it. You know, it's just, that's life. That's the way things happen. But um, when we went opposition, we started, uh, we started trying to demean their, uh, their uh, promotion. And also, it was a bit of, there's quite a bit of it personal. It wasn't just me, all of us. I mean, Bobby was, you know, Bobby was upset too. He's the one that actually, Dickie got booked with us through him, through Bobby. And Bobby brought him forward, and I said, sure, you get good talent. So, you know, all of us were very disappointed in him, you know, and, and uh, you know, felt betrayed. And uh, But we we put an ad in the in Knoxville paper for everyone, for all our shows. We'd be running Knoxville the same night. We put a picture in there of Dickie and myself, and we had every match. We had a lights-out match after the regular show was over. Uh, and, you know, he had to show up. Uh, losers of chicken or something like that. So we was basically being insulted every week. Now, uh, so I don't sound like a complete, you know, uh, uh, knocker here, like I'm saying, well, yeah, you expect him to come to your show. I went to their show. I went to the, I went to the Knoxville show by myself, and uh, I don't remember why we weren't working that night, but whatever it was, I went to a Knoxville show, the police wouldn't let me in through the back where the boys come out. They told me 
uh, no, we've been told you can't come in here. So I went and bought a ticket, and I sat as close as I could to the ring, and I wasn't, I wasn't uh, threatening, I wasn't uh, glaring, I wasn't making any uh, uh, any kind of you know over uh, actions to be threatening. But of course, my very presence, you know, the fans knew what was going on. My very presence there, I'm sure, was uh, you know disconcerting and. Some of the boys might have worried I was going to come jump in the ring or something, but I was never going to do anything like that. But I just went to show that, look, you know, we're talking about credibility here. Um, I'm not afraid to come to your show. I mean, I'm by myself. It's not me and Ronnie and Bobby and Malenko with his chain and, you know, Crusher Boomfield or whoever. Uh, I don't think, you know, he uh, well, he still was. Anyway, it wasn't, it wasn't three or four. It was just me. And... Uh, you know, I'm not a Bruiser Brody or, you know, some giant monster guy. Uh, but, you know, I, I wasn't planning on attacking anybody, but I wanted to show that, okay, I'm willing to come to, into your bailiwick, and it was to prove a point. If I'm willing to come to yours, why aren't you willing to come to ours? And so, you know, it created, of course, it put a lot of pressure on Dickie, and the violence resulted. I went into their bar again by myself. And it was to force his hand because after that stuff in the newspaper um, of calling him a coward, uh, well, chicken, but you know, that's the worst. Probably coward would be better. Um, he, uh, you know, he had to do something. I mean, Andre was there and all the guys on that, they had a big card, and uh, a lot of the guys were there. And I'm standing there in the bar by myself. Dickie had to do something. And we got into it and, uh, in his book, Terry Falk wrote that Dickie beat me up. Uh, I, if it, I'll, let me preface by saying Jack Mulligan did beat me up, but he did hit me one time and knock me for a loop. I happened to be looking in the other direction when he did it. Now, everybody says that. I know that. But if, <laughs> believe me, if I saw Jack Mulligan getting ready to punch me, I would have ducked or something. But uh, he knocked me for a loop. I managed to get out of there without getting killed. He, he, he just, Jack had some problems. And he would, you know, later he sent word to the Iron Sheep that he was sorry. It was nothing I did. It was just he was having a bad day or some stuff like that. But so, I mean, I have been, I have been uh, beaten in a contest of force. Uh, I, I left the dressing room because of my eye was bleeding. I, I couldn't see it on my left eye. I was worried about losing it that something had hit me so hard to where it was numb, I was worried about. So I left the dressing room to reconnoiter. Now, outside the dressing room, I did wait for a few minutes to see if he was going to come out by himself, and he didn't. Um, so I took, I went off to get, get my eye checked. But, so I'm prefacing that by saying, no, I'm not Mr. Infallible. I can't be beat or whatever. But um, when I went into the bar with Dickie, uh, I went by myself. Because again, by putting the pressure on it, oh, I know where I left it off. In, in Terry's book, and I, I've been wanting to talk to Terry, but I don't want to do it on the phone. But there's an inaccuracy. Dickie told him he beat me up. Um, I'm telling you, Dickie Slater, the closest he got to me, he was trying to grab me by the hair. I had three guys holding me. He was trying to grab me by the hair, so he, because I was bobbing and weaving, so he couldn't just walk up and and blast me. And he was, he had was nobody holding him. And there's two guys still alive that can, one of them was holding me, that can attest to this. But, um, you know, he was going to leave. And I called him back. And I said, well, what, are you getting ready to leave? I got three guys holding me and you're going to weasel out. Because I knew that if he left, that the story would go out that he had beaten me and all that. I didn't, for business reasons and personal too. I, uh, I didn't want, so I called him back and he came. The guy was still holding me for some reason. I don't know why. I should have beat them up, anybody. But anyway, who are, who, uh, who are the guys holding you, Bob? One of them was Hoot Gibson. The other two guys worked in the bar. They weren't boys. Okay. Hoot, later on, I asked him, Hoot, I said, why the hell were you holding me? I said, you, you're on my side. I said, you should have grabbed him. He said, well, I, I didn't think he could do anything, Bob. I was worried about you. <laughs> I guess it's a compliment, but thanks, Hoot, you almost got me killed. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, <laughs> hold Andre. Don't hold me. <laughs> you know, go hold on on the leg so I could run. Uh, but um, so uh, Dickie came back and he was going to, you know, you guys are holding me. He's going to try to punch me. Well, I had a blackjack in my boot 
and I pulled it out and I blasted him. I missed him kind of glancing the first time. I got him on a second one, and it rocked him pretty good, and it busted him open a little bit, and and Tommy Rich came out of the bar about that same time, about that time, and, and grabbed him, and Slater let him pull him out of the bar. If he had wanted to fight, he definitely could have kept going, but he said something about, oh, you had to use a blackjack. Oh, yeah, you're lucky I didn't have a bazooka, man. Uh, but, uh, but that was the, that was the extent of our, uh, you know, I wanted to tell Terry, because here I am belying his, uh, well, you know what, it's good, because I already talked about Terry and how much I respect him. What I wanted to tell him was, Terry, you have been done an injustice and in service, uh, uh, because in your book, if there's anything that's not true in your book, one one mis misfact in there, or you know, one unfounded uh, part of your book, if it's not true, it leads it lends to the credibility of everything else that's in there. So there's a there's a misstatement in your book. Dicky Slater has never ever laid even a fingernail on me in anger, and he never he never did. I think when we were working out in a tap in a sportatorium, we weren't trying to hurt each other, so there wasn't anger involved. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't have any problem admitting when I've been bested, you know, life has a way, <laughs> you see those pictures of me lately, life's been kicking my butt pretty good, but, uh, <laughs> life is still well, undefeated, Bob. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. You know, I'm still, we're, we're going Broadway for the moment. <laughs> I'm trying to make it about another 25 year match, but, uh, uh, yeah, and, and you know it was unfortunate that happened. You know, Dicky had his had his demons like we all do, and and uh, you know he he uh, I, I don't think he was emotionally equipped. Uh, uh, Psycho Bible, but uh, you know to handle some of the things that he 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 got himself into, and um, you know I think you know I didn't I lost track of him the last twenty five thirty years. I'm not sure. I asked somebody the other day if they knew how he got into the wheelchair, and uh, you know what happened to him. And I, I, because I didn't, I just forgot him. I didn't think about him. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm sorry that. I got to be honest. I don't feel pain, uh, but for those, I do feel compassion for those people who cared for Dickie, uh, not for him himself. Uh, he got himself where he got, including his demise, by most of, in most chances, it wasn't like something happened to him in life by something else happening to him or somebody else doing something to him. He got there by himself. And so his demise, it might have been a relief to him in his final moments, maybe to know, well, last is agony is over. But turning to people like who, who do have fond memories and all that, I feel sorry. I, I'm sorry that you're feeling that compassion. and. And that, you know, those condolences, and they're, they're well merited because it speaks well to the people who are feeling them. You didn't see a side of Dickie that you weren't on the inside. You didn't see the demon side of Dickie that I did. And, uh, you know, and but what we try to do now in our reunions and everything, all those grudges are forgotten, and people are remembering the good things on Facebook. I see it all the time. Uh, all the all any misunderstandings or, or arguments or disagreements are forgotten, and people are saying, "Hey, I remember when we did this and we did that," and they're thinking about good things, and that's the way life should be if you want to have a happy, you know, or at least a contented older life. You got to let all that stuff go, and uh, I don't think Dickie was able to. Um, I I was I. I left many 30 years ago, and I've got a family, and my two boys and I still own a home together, and so, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with my life now, And but again, for those people who are, are hurt or feeling any angst, pain, or regrets, or whatever with, with Dickie, uh, his loved ones, people who loved him, um, you have my condolences. I feel sorry that you're, I, I'm sorry that you feel that way, and I'm not saying it's not merited. Not what happened between me and Dickie was just between us. I'm not saying that he was that way with everybody. I'm sure with other people he, you know, had maybe very, very loving and and uh, you know, good, good relationships that were were, were of value.
Bob, listen, we got to tell you, we really appreciate you taking uh, some time out to uh, reminisce uh, on the career of Dick Slater and your own career and uh, some of the uh, stuff that you had to tell us. Uh, we always love discussing wrestling history. That's uh, that's our baseline here on Breaking Kayfabe with Bowdrin and Barry. And we, uh, uh, on behalf of Barry, we certainly appreciate your time uh, discussing Dick Slater and your career. Well, thank you very much for having me on. I mean, without you guys... Uh, that career would be uh, done and buried. And so it's still, <laughs> it would be, think about it. It's still, my career is still going on thanks to folks like you. And I tell you, it's the ultimate in respect and uh, regard that you do that. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, but I'm okay. going to try. Okay. So thanks again, Bob. And we'll talk to you again.